Hi all, Dr. Clark here for Fish and Wildlife Management. This lecture we're talking about aerial photographs and GIS. Now as we talk about game management or fish and wildlife management, we need to talk about techniques that are, um, I guess, newer techniques. Within the last 10, 15, 20 years, um, this is uh, techniques that prior to really high-tech computers, um, they just weren't capable of analyzing material in a manner like we are today. And it's even getting more high-tech and, and um, easier to analyze the data, uh, faster to analyze the data, et cetera. Some of that data comes from aerial photographs or using a program um, called ArcGIS or GIS. And we'll get to that in a second. Because managers cannot travel and cover all the ground possible, maybe in their unit, maybe, you know, they're a manager of, you know, southwestern Wyoming. Okay, and they manage the entire southwestern corner of Wyoming. Well, there's no real way that you can ground truth or, or cover all that land. So part of the way that you can do that is by having aerial photographs taken of the landscape. Guys, for example, you can see here that, you know, this is an aerial photograph. And if we're interested in, you know, habitat or if we're interested in managing for habitat, we can see that, you know, in this region, there's there's houses in this corner. So this is, um, you know, low intensity housing, low intensity um, development. Okay. Uh, Wildlife will encounter, be encountered and, and will often travel through this region. This region here is continuous forest. Okay? But maybe we're more interested in, well, what kind of forest is it? What percent of this forest is deciduous? What per percent is coniferous? Is there shrubland you know, uh, adjacent to it? How much farmland is adjacent to it? Okay, in a given region, and that gives us an idea of, okay, well, without going and, you know, having boots on the ground and constantly um, measuring things with tape measures and things like that, can we get an idea, can we get a rough estimate of what's the food resources for a group of organisms, maybe deer, elk, whatever it might be in this case, okay, what's What's the habitat, um, so the cover, uh, so they can escape predators or so they can bed down, etc. Maybe we're talking about birds and they need, you know, a certain type of habitat to uh, nest in and a certain type of habitat to feed in. We can get an idea of that from using aerial photographs or, or GIS, okay? Um, so I'm going to talk, you know, quite a bit about this and, you know, some of this will be brand new to you, but this is just a, you know, a, a snippet, a, a small kind of oversight on or small overview, I should say, of aerial photographs and GIS. Most wildlife managers today need to have a course in GIS. So if you're going into wildlife, if you're going into fisheries, you need to get a GIS course under your belt. It's highly important. Um, this program is used or programs are used constantly in management because again, with budget cuts, with, um, you know, Washington controlling the money for your agency, you never really know well, how many boots can we get on the ground to check out this material, this, you know, habitat out. <clears throat> Are we going to have boots, period? Okay. Well, you always have, most often, you'll always have a computer. You'll have access to aerial photographs because 
they're free and um, you know uh, USGS takes pictures about every five years um, of the entire United States and they update their photographs and then they turn them into um, GIS data which we'll get to in a second okay so that's always there anyone can go on like you personally can go on if you have a way to examine the material you can go on and you can examine this material and make judgment calls for yourself okay so let's dive into some of the terminology and then i'll give you some examples of how this can be utilized all right so first off there are three main types of aerial photographs okay um one that is useful and two that are pretty okay so vertical photographs are the most useful aerial photographs or really the only ones that are useful from the purpose of data analysis okay? they're taken with an aerial camera okay? and now there are a couple ways that you can these can be done i've personally um, taken photographs this way quite a few times um, of many different samples uh, i mean i was working on pelicans and so we did aerial photographs over Re uh, roosting or nesting islands and did pelican counts off of those aerial photographs i've taken pictures of you know wetlands um blackbird habitat these kind of things and it's done from an airplane that flies at a given height okay with a port in the belly of the airplane in which either you have a camera that's attached to that and it runs over to a computer and you can snap photographs or you do it the old-fashioned way this is the way I did it is you stick your camera through the port okay? you're laying on your belly on the you know on the belly of the plane and you're snapping photographs and um, hopefully you're snapping photographs at a given you know amount of time or you know a given distance so you can get all those photographs you can stack them all together and you get a big picture but at any rate um a vertical photograph is pointed straight down on the earth's surface okay at a given distance okay it's considered vertical as long as there's no more than three percent tilt okay and so when a vertical photograph is taken um now a lot of pilots who do this they can take the photographs themselves so basically it's an automated camera system and um you know they just once they get to a region where they need to take the pictures okay they just flip it on and it just starts taking pictures um across the entire distance that they're traveling okay the old-fashioned way you have a pilot and a photographer and the pilot says okay we're you know here and you can start photographs and then the photographer starts taking pictures okay? and then um the pilot would say okay that's the transect number one or whatever so you went in a straight line and then you stop and then the pilot's going to loop back around and start the next line and then loop back around start the next line etc okay either way either way it's done okay as long as there's less than three percent tilt it's considered a vertical photograph now that's really important because anything more than three percent tilt causes um angle and angled so you cannot use it for gis analysis and you i'll show you that in a second now there are lots of other ways that which you can take aerial photographs you can do oblique photographs which is you know the camera's pointed at an, at an angle okay somewhere in between vertical and horizontal and I'll, often you'll see this okay, when you look at like google google earth um you'll see oblique photographs okay google earth you, you can rotate the camera too because they're rotating the camera when they're taking their pictures okay now that's not to say that google earth is completely useless but when it comes to sticking those photographs 
into GIS data, you can't do it. Okay, so they do allow you to look at a panoramic view. It allows you to look at seasonal data, okay, those kind of things. But as far as data analysis, it's fairly useless. Okay? And the final one is a mosaic photographs, and this is where a lot of pictures are taken continuously. Okay, and they are um, cut and pasted together. Okay, again, it's great for a large photograph. It's great. It makes great PowerPoint presentations and posters on walls and things like that, but are fairly worthless for analysis. <clears throat> okay, so let's say you've taken the picture and you've done it correctly. Less than 3% tilt, you know the height, okay? Then you need to know the scale because your photograph is going to be different than, you know, actual uh, you know, foot on the ground distances. And so you need to be able to scale your photographs. To do that, you calculate an RF factor or the representative fraction. So let's say we're interested in a RF factor of, or representative fraction of 1 to 13,200. Okay? Now, that 13,200 depends on the individual who's calculating the representative fraction. That could be one inch for every 13,200 feet. It could be one centimeter for every 13,200 miles. Okay, it really depends on the photograph and the individual that's calculating the representative fraction. Okay, so here's there are a couple ways at which you can cal calculate this. If you know the camera's focal length, okay, and the height that the photograph was taking taken above ground, then you can calculate an RF factor. Unfortunately, unless you're the individual who took the photograph or the pilot that you know, flew the airplane and took the photograph, okay? you're probably not going to know the RF factor of an aerial photograph. Okay? So there's another way that you can do this. No, probably more common for lay people that didn't take the photograph or weren't the pilot. And that is to do what we call ground truth. Okay? So you have an aerial photograph and you have landmarks on that aerial photograph. So maybe you have two roads on the aerial photograph. Okay? And you know the distance, the photographic distance between the two points. Okay? In this case, we're going to calculate it as feet, even though you know that the photograph's not even, probably not even a foot wide. Okay? So it's going to be point something feet is the distance between those. Um, between the two roads, and then you go out and you actually measure the distance between those two points. That gives you a representative fraction. Okay? So you then would be able to use that photograph and you can calculate things like, well, percent land cover, percent road, percent deforestation, the length of a river, the width of the river, et cetera, without ever actually measuring the river because you measured one thing. And the photograph is an aerial photograph, a legitimate aerial photograph that's taken under 3% tilt. Okay? So <clears throat> let's say the distance between the road on the photograph is 0 0.3 feet. The ground distance was 3,960 feet. Okay? If you take 0 0.3 divided by 3,960, the representative fraction um, or the ratio is 1 to 
13,200. Okay? That's what we're after for a representative fraction. Okay? So um, <clears throat> that's how you calculate it. And you guys are going to have an assignment um, in which you can uh, utilize the, this equation, mainly the second equation, okay, to calculate the representative fraction and then answer some questions about some data. All right. Let's also look at, well, what can you do? Let's say you got your photograph. You know the representative fraction. You know the RF factor. Now, what can you do with that? Okay. Well, if you know that your, you pulled the photograph or you know that your photograph is capable of being developed into cover types or ca um, classified as cover types, then you can use the cover type data from uh, USGS. So let's, we're going to jump into this. I'm going to go to the site and I'm going to pull up the national data for land cover or the land cover database. Okay, And it says 2011, but it's good for 2016. So like I said, about every five years, so 2021, they'll probably take aerial photographs again um, and maybe they'll update the descriptions of uh, the different habitat types but it's it's doubtful um, these habitat types have been the same for for quite a while so um, there are 11 different ha habitat types okay now what what goes on is a aerial photograph is broken up into numbers and they're classified by numbers but because we're not really going to look at the number necessarily we're going to look at the color so they're color coded and i'll show you in a second what i mean by that but for example if it's blue on the map then it would be indicating that it's open water. If it's white, it indicates that it's ice or snow, okay? and on and on and on. If it's dark red, it indicates that it's developed high intensity. Okay? And we just keep going down. Barren land, deciduous forest, evergreen forest, mixed forest, dwarf shrub, shrub, okay? grassland, sedge, lichens, moss, pasture hay, cultivated crops, wood, wooded wetlands. Okay, and emergent herbaceous wetlands. Okay, so those are your classification types. Okay? And what happens is your aerial photo, aerial photo is broken up into pixels. Those pixels are determined okay, as one of these classification systems. Okay? So basically, what that pixel is done is what's dominating that pixel now maybe it's maybe it's 70 percent developed high intensity a single pixel and you know 30 percent developed open space okay well in that case it's going to register that pixel as developed high intensity so you do lose a little bit of data when you transfer your data from aerial photograph into GIS data. However, by doing this, it allows you to get a much better calculation. And because the computer is doing this, there's not a huge bias from individuals saying, well, I don't know, that looks more like 50% to me. Um, versus, you know, the computer's classifying as 70%, okay? So it, it gets rid of that, you know, human bias when it comes to classifying data um, of aerial photographs. Okay? So if we jump back in and we can look at some other things. So maybe based on these cover type data, maybe you're interested in a given region. Maybe you want to know, okay, how much is urban versus non-urban? How much is grazed 
versus non-grazed. So how much um, is actual grazed land that organisms can consume versus non-grazed, grazable material? So in other words, you're interested in wildlife feeding grounds. Okay? How much is forested versus non-forested? So you're looking at cover or um, you know potential sanctuaries for these animals from predators and from you know climate etc maybe it's important to know how much is deciduous versus coniferous okay, so how much of this material is going to change come a different season the leaves are going to fall so now the cover of that you know habitat is going to change quite a bit or maybe seeds or other food type is important in that region so there's lots of ways to look at the cover type and by digitizing or taking the aerial photograph and making it into a GIS plot or GIS um, database it allows for us to make these distinctions between the habitat types now a lot of this really depends on a couple things so it depends on the quality of the photograph, the scale at which it was taken, the season of the photograph, the type of film and all that, but that's all controlled. And most people who are going into management, you will never be dealing with the quality, the scale, the season, or the type of film. And maybe the season, because you might be like, hey, we need photographs in the fall. And so you hire someone to come out and take pictures in the fall or we need some in the middle of winter etc okay so you might control that but scale probably not quality probably not and you're definitely not going to choose the type of film from that though now the most important piece okay of all habitat recognition or all um land use data really comes in the interpreter's background. How do you interpret the data? What's more important is, you know, 50% deciduous and 50% coniferous. Is that meaningful to the researcher? Right? How does that, how does that, how can you use that data to better the management of your organism. That's really what using GIS and using aerial photos really needs to come about and, and the purpose of it. What can you do with the data? How is it meaningful? Okay. How do you interpret the data? Okay. So for example, let's just take, this is just a Google Earth shot. Okay. You can see that it's a little bit tilted. So this is not an aerial photo. Um, but you can see that from this, maybe we're really interested in, you know, this tributary, this small stream that you can see you running here. Okay, this feeds into the Sweetwater. So this is on um, South Pass in Wyoming. Okay, and so there's this little stream that sweet, feeds into the Sweetwater River. And okay? maybe we're interested in, uh, well, what percent of this landscape is shrub step what percent is coniferous forest what percent is grassland what percent is barren land okay maybe that's of interest to us okay because you know we're trying to figure out well how much food is available for the organisms in this region okay? that might dictate how many organisms or what size of your of population you want to keep in that given region so you want all your organisms to basically have as much food as they can eat okay but at the same time you don't want to also say okay well there's as much food as they can eat in this region but there's not enough habitat for them to seek shelter okay? or maybe we have two competing competing resources maybe we allow for cattle grazing in this region 
or sheep grazing in this region, but we also want to manage for elk populations and deer populations and antelope populations. Okay? So then maybe the manager is like, okay, well, how many how many uh, head of cattle are we going to allow in this land? Okay? Um, how many sheep are we going to allow on this land? Okay? So this might come from a manager of, well, whose land is it? Is this Forest Service land? So that's Forest Service decision. Is this, um, you know, is this uh, BLM land? Well, that's BLM's decision. Well, but both Forest Service and BLM will listen to fish and game managers because fish and game managers obviously have a interest in the land also because of hunting and fishing in that region. Okay? And so as long as the entities, as long as BLM, Forest Service, and Fish and Game all work together, then you can manage a land so cattle can graze on it, sheep could graze on it, and you can also have enough food resources and habitat for elk and antelope or whatever it might be that you're managing. So Google Earth photographs are nice because you can see in real time, well, whenever the photograph was taken, you can see what the habitat looked like. Okay, You don't really get that with ArcGIS, but again, you can't analyze these for land use cover. Okay. So let's jump into GIS. What is GIS? It's Geographic Information Systems, and you might hear me often say ArcGIS. Well, Arc is a program that you can utilize to analyze geographic information systems or analyze GIS data. ARC is just a company that's kind of got, you know, they're, they kind of got their arms around GIS data. Okay? So yes, there are small off-market programs that can also analyze GIS data, but for the most part, if you work for an agency, you're using ArcGIS. Right? If you go to a classroom and you're taking a GIS class, you're using ArcGIS. Right? Um, and that's just because the, the capabilities of that program is really second to none. Right? So <clears throat> GIS is really geographic information systems. And what it is, is it's a way to capture store, retrieve, and analyze spatial data. Okay? So you have an aerial photograph. It captures that aerial photograph. It stores it. It retrieves it. It allows for you to analyze maybe percent of a certain habitat type, um, or maybe you're looking at elevation data. Okay, And so it's a lot more than just land cover. You can look at road densities. You can look at all kinds of waterways, all kinds of things in GIS that um, are not part of that land use data that I'm showing you and really talking about. Most managers are interested in the land use data, but GIS can be used to, well, predict um, you know, what would happen if you built a road here. Uh, what happens if you build a building here and see seawater rises by one inch or you know by six inches in the next 50 years? What will happen to that that building? Things like that. Lots of GIS programs have been used to build cities and to design cities uh, um, from a efficient way, um, hopefully efficient way. Um, for disasters or um, prevention of disasters or, you know, commute times, those kind of things for roadways, etc. So GIS is, you know, used across the board. As a manager, though, most often it's used to, you know, to provide that data of well, how much habitat is available for wildlife in that given region. Okay, there are two main forms of data that come out of GIS, and one is what we call raster data. Okay? Raster data are those little teeny pixel data um, 
you know, that we talked about before. Okay? That pixel is distinguished as either it's forested habitat or rangeland, grassland, hay, crop, water, etc. Okay, so each little teeny cell, each little teeny grid is distinguished as a certain type. So these are basically ones, twos, threes, etc. That just distinguishes that data as a raster. Okay? A vector, on the other hand, so vector data is a line data or point between one point and another point. Okay? And it's useful when examining areas on a map or areas on the planet. Okay? And most of the time, it corresponds directly to UTMs or Universal Transverse Mercator. Okay? And we talked about this before when we talked about looking at you know where you're at um, or where you took a photograph at that you should be um, telling me you know the position on the planet in UTMs versus um, you know percent or minutes seconds okay uh, because UTMs directly corresponds to GIS okay and that's really why I want you to use UTMs when you um, report coordinates is because it goes right back into the GIS system. And if you're going to be a manager, you're going to be using GIS, so you might as well start using UTMs also. So looking at the data, this is what it kind of really looks like. Okay, raster data again are just these boxes. Okay? Vector data are lines and distances. So that helps you um, basically truth that this is really where it occurs on the planet. Okay, so if raster data alone, it's just lines and boxes, but you might not be making lines and boxes of the material that's actually of interest. Vectors correct for that and make sure that, hey, you're looking at the exact spot on the planet. Now, here's the problem. Okay? Unless you truth this, unless you analyze this for elevation, one thing that is lost using raster and vector data is elevation, is the actual, you know, real world um, out elevation of the, you know, landscape. Now, it depends on how important that is to you. Um, how important is the elevation in a given region? Well, a lot of times that dictates the habitat type, okay? but you already have that data. So what else? I mean, what else is important with that elevation? Is it going to dictate how much moisture you get throughout the year? Yeah, possibly. I mean, and there's a pretty good connection between moisture and elevation. So <clears throat> that might be lost when using raster and vector data. Okay? So that might be something that you want to pick up, precipitation data, that kind of stuff, um, and utilize that as a manager also. Okay, so here you can see, um, this is UTM grid. Okay? So the whole planet is divided into little grids, and UTMs are based on where you're at on that planet. So for example, let's say we're examining southwestern Wyoming, okay? then we would say, okay, well, we're in vector 12, okay? T. Okay? So that indicates 12, T indicates what um, you know, box we're in. And that would include you know, parts of Montana, Idaho, Utah, and you know, close to half of Wyoming. Then you have a north heading and a eastern heading, okay? and that will pinpoint the exact spot on the planet. Like I said before, the nice thing about UTMs is there are no two UTMs that are the same. Now, when you use percent or when you use minutes and seconds, okay, then you can have two 
latitude and longitudes or longitudes that are the same on the planet that that only differ by a negative or a positive okay? so if we were you know examining say you know southwestern wyoming and you know we get a coordinate that says you know you know 130 degrees or something like that i don't know um well in actuality it's negative 130 degrees okay and if you forget the negative it actually puts you on the other side of the midline and it puts you in you know russia or northern china right? and that's where um that coordinate would put you so that's why UTMs are so useful, and that's why a lot of programs use UTMs, is because negative signs in programs often get you know, lost, or the program doesn't recognize the negative sign, and um, it, it's not useful. You can't use it. So in the case of latitude, longitude, if you use UTMs, then um, you don't have to worry about negatives and you just have this grid system that the entire world is broken up into and you have to remember that you know there's a kind of a a east or west coordinates which is based on a single number okay and then a north south letter okay which puts you at a certain point on the planet and that's how utms work all right, so let's look at an example of how land use data or ArcGIS can be used in examining something about a population. So this is some data that I have collected um, for a while, okay? and this is just point data of a certain species. Okay, this is a point data of Ambystoma tigrinum or tiger salamanders. Just a couple points here. You can tell based on you know the outline that this is washington state okay and this is the land use data for washington state you can see heavy urban environment here heavy urban environment here okay this is you know seattle bellingham tacoma puyallup those regions okay along the water okay and this is spokane um, Washington out here on the other side. Okay, so <clears throat> looking at this, let's say I collected salamanders or I observed salamanders in a given region. Okay, so I can pull this data up, but now what I can do with this is I can zoom in on a single point or zoom in on two points, okay, two salamanders that were caught that were fairly close to each other. Okay, so if I zoom in on them, now I can see what each one of these pixel boxes is classified as. Okay? And so let's say, you know, there are two salamanders. They were pretty close to each other. You know, they're within like five feet of each other. So a, you know, a GPS coordinates of the two is going to be really close to identical for the two. And that, that, that's completely fine. So you have two dots. You have two lines. You can see these lines that overlap. Um, the first circle that I've done is a radius that, you know, maybe um, this radius is 100 meters. And the radius around these, and, and this depends on the individual. This is kind of my work. So um, I'm interested in basically, well, how far can the animal move in maybe one day? Yeah. So what's what's the average distance that you know an organism moves in a single day, and that might be my inner radius, my inner circle. So in a single day, this is the habitat that they're going to encounter. Okay. And then this outer radius, this outer circle, might be okay. Well, what could they move, or how far could they move in a year? Or, you know, what's the average area that they're going to occupy in a given year? Okay? Salamanders don't move very much. And so, you know, you might, this might be 500 meters. I, I don't, 
no, you know, it really just depends on the organism. Okay. Well, what I'm interested often and what managers are interested in, well, what habitat are they encountering? Okay. What is the habitat in which this organism or this group of organisms is going to encounter on a daily basis or going to encounter on a yearly basis? Now, for some organisms, this, you know, this radius is huge. Okay? If you're talking about you know, mule deer in Wyoming, you know, you're talking about from Jackson Hole all the way down into the Red Desert. Okay? We're talking miles and miles away. So your radius, radius is huge, okay? but it's still of interest. Okay? Well, you know, you can do the same thing. Maybe you're not interested in mule deer. Maybe you're interested in, you know, something you know, that's fairly stationary or doesn't occupy a lot of space, like rabbits. So maybe you're interested in desert cottontails. Okay? So you can do the same thing and you can examine what they're in what they're going to encounter so if we're examining that big radius in a year you know this tiger salamander might encounter okay high intensity developed areas <clears throat> that is about 29 percent of the land that this organism would encounter would be high intensity developed in with low intensity is about 13 percent so right there you're looking you know at close to you know a little under 50 percent of the data okay 42 percent of your land is developed okay that tells you something right there that this organism seems to be able well depending on the organism depending on you know, the life history of the organism, maybe they're not doing very well, and maybe that's what, what it is, or maybe they're doing quite well, and they seem to be able to inhabit urban environments and do fairly well in those urban environments. So this would tell you, you know, back, you, you know, tell you more about the landscape, and then you can link it to other things. Like, I typically link it to parasites or you know quality of life reproductive output these kind of things okay the rest of the land is either barren land so rocks and and, and dirt okay or dwarf shrub step okay so there's quite a bit of dwarf shrub shrubbery on the outside so maybe it is that these organisms move into the urban environments um during certain times of the year to overwinter maybe or maybe to feed in the summer okay and maybe they're out in the dwarf shrub in the winter okay so again this will totally depend on the interpretation of the material when the photograph was taken when the organism was captured and then what you're going to do with that data okay but with that that's kind of the overview of GIS data, aerial photo data, okay, and um, now you can calculate the RF vector, you can work with that, and you know, you can look at GIS data again. GIS data is completely free. Um, USGI, USGS puts it out, it's on their website, you can download it. Um, you have to have a program that can run it. That's where a lot of times the expense comes in, but there are some free programs out there that can run GIS data. So if you want to play with it, examine things like land use maps, etc. for data like this, you can, you can do that. Okay. So <clears throat> next time we'll bring uh, another technique that managers use um, in the field.